Okay, hello, welcome back. Um, this is the end of the last lecture, which um, I actually have already done, but just to myself, because the video magically cut off and decided that uh, you had had enough. So anyway, here we go with the, a couple of quick examples for the integral test section 11.3. Um, so just remember what the integral test says, right? We have it right here. If we have a function f, that's defined in terms of the um, generating term of a, of a series. And we know that our function is continuous, positive, and decreasing for all x greater than or equal to 1. 1 here isn't so special. Um, if, we can start, if we start counting somewhere else at 37, then that's fine as well, right? x from 37 to infinity. Um, but we need co continuous, positive, and decreasing. Um, when we do the proof, we'll see more of why that is important. And, um, but you saw it through the examples last time. If we know that, then the infinite series and the improper integral have the exact same behavior, right? And so the way that we generally use this um, result is, is as an integral test because evaluating this integral is easier than evaluating this series. And so determining whether this integral converges is, is easier than determining whether a series converges in general in, in, for us. So let's take a look. Here's our example, 11.3, number, uh, number 8, one of your homework problems. Um, and we have a sum n equals 1 to infinity of n squared e to the negative n. Whoops, I wrote it down wrong. Oh, goodness. Let's try that one more time. n squared e to the negative n cubed. That one would have been harder. Um, n squared e to the negative n cubed, the question is, does this series converge or diverge? Okay? Now, since let's not dive right into the integral test. Let's think as we the way we ought to be thinking if we were you know, maybe facing a problem like this in general, randomly, not knowing where it came from, right? What are some things that should go through your mind? Okay, number one, right? Does the divergence test tell us anything? Does divergence test um, work? That's question first. That's the first thing to think about. Um, okay, well, first of all, what does the divergence test say? What is the only thing you can conclude from the divergence test? good divergence. Okay, so what do you do to do the divergence test? We look at the limit as n goes to infinity of the nth term, right? a sub n. So what would that be here? It would be the limit as n goes to infinity of n squared e to the minus n cubed. Now, that limit um, might not one be one you're super familiar with, but let's review a little bit about things that we did at the very beginning of this semester, right? n is n squared is going where? To infinity, right? e to the minus n cubed, that's exponential decay, right? As n is getting huge, right? Because of that minus sign, so that's going to zero. So that's infinity times zero, which you know is a good indeterminate form, okay? Very nice, right? Infinity times zero is not zero. Um, okay, so what do you have to do? You've got to rewrite this limit so that you can deal with it. So how do you, what do you want to do in order to be able to turn this into something that you can deal with? Excellent. You want to use algebra to rewrite e to the negative n cubed as n squared divided by e to the n cubed, right? Okay, so that's algebra. Now what do I have? I have an infinity over infinity in determinant form, right? Okay, and so this guy, I've got some options. Um, you can use L'Hopital's rule here. If you did L'Hopital's rule twice, you would then eventually see that, um, that this limit actually goes to zero, okay? Um, this exponential term grows much more quickly than this uh, power n squared, and very quickly this guy dominates, so this infinity is stronger and this limit goes to zero, right? This guy in the, denom the infinity in the denominator wants to drive the whole thing to zero. The infinity in the numerator wants to blow everything up. It's a battle between good and evil, right? And this time, this one wins, right? Limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n is zero, so what do we know? We know 
nothing, right? We know nothing, yeah? The divergence test didn't work, right? In order for the divergence test to work, we need to know that the limit as n goes to infinity of base of n is not zero. If that limit is not zero, I can conclude from the divergence test that the series diverges, period, right? If this limit is zero, the series could diverge or could converge. So we don't know. Divergence test told us nothing, right? Okay, so that's not a bad thing to just review. What else, okay, is this a P-series? No, right? So make sure you know what the P-series is. It's not too hard to see. It's not a P-series. Um, is it a geometric series? No, it's not a geometric series either, okay? So um, it doesn't look like it's a telescoping sum where we'd be able to come up with some nice little subtraction thing. No, right? So pretty clear right away that if you're faced with this, integral test is the way to go based on what we know so far, right? That there is no other test that's going to get us there. Okay, um, so now we're going to want to go to and try the integral test for this problem, okay? So what do we want to do? Well, um, does the integral test apply? That's our question. Does the integral test apply? Okay, what has to be true in order to use the integral test? These three things, right? So let's identify our f of x, right? This is our a sub n. So what is f of x? Let's replace the n's with x's, yeah? Okay, replace the n's with x's, yeah? Okay, so what do we have? We have x squared e to the minus x cubed, yeah? Okay, kind of similarly over here, you probably really want to... Um, Think about doing L'Hopital's rule, you want to replace those guys with x's so that you actually can take derivatives, right? But x is the continuous variable. Okay, so um, here's our guy, and the question is, is that continuous? So let's think about this function. This function is a product of two functions. It's a power function uh, times an exponential function, right? This is a polynomial. Polynomial is continuous everywhere. We love that. Exponential, continuous everywhere. We love that. This guy up here, also continuous everywhere. There's nothing bad that can happen to this function, right? So where is this function? This guy is continuous everywhere, okay? So these are the hypotheses, right? Um, so the hypotheses of the integral test one, what do we know? We've got, we've got this guy is continuous right, where it's continuous really everywhere, right, okay, so it's certainly continuous on uh, 1 to infinity, right, it's actually continuous on minus infinity to infinity, right, so we've got continuity for this guy, yeah, okay, um, what's the second hypothesis is that this guy is positive, okay, all right, I've got e to stuff, what do you tell me about e to stuff, beautiful, always positive. We love e to stuff. Always positive. x squared, something squared, always positive or zero. So this guy is positive as long as x is in zero, right? Okay, so this is positive for x not zero. Well, we only cared about positive for one to infinity, right? And um, so we're certainly positive for x greater than or equal to one, right? That's what we really need, okay? Yeah, okay. And then finally, third, the question is, ooh, decreasing, okay? Okay, well, what are we gonna have to do to, to determine decreasing? Yep, calculus, good. We wanna look at f prime, okay? So here's our f of x. Written this way, if I'm gonna take the derivative, what rule do I need to use? Good, right, okay? product rule. It's a product of two functions. Now I could write it this way, and then what rule would I use? Quotient rule to take the derivative, right? Which is very different than doing L'Hopital's rule. You don't do quotient rule there. Okay, let's leave it like this and do the product rule. Okay, so what is f prime of x? I'm going to quick check and make sure this video is still filming uh, while you compute f prime of x. Yes, indeed, we're good. Okay, um, so what is f prime of x? Product rule says First guy times the derivative of the second guy. What's the derivative of the second guy? Second guy is e to the stuff. What's the derivative of e to the stuff? e to the stuff times the derivative of the stuff, right? I'm going to need 
more space. What's the derivative of my stuff? Minus 3x squared. Yeah? Okay. Um, so now what? What sign goes here? Good. Plus? Plus what? Plus the derivative of the first guy times the second guy. Yeah? Lots of ways to write the product rule. Um, that's one way. All right, what do I do after I've like done this? When, when I'm looking for where a derivative is positive, negative, zero, all of that kind of stuff, what do I do after I take a derivative? Yeah, yeah, we factor, right? Factor, factor. So what do we have in here that's consistent in both terms, right? We got an e to the minus x cubed factor in each term. What else do we have? Well, the only other thing we really have is an x, right? This guy has an x, right? That's two x's, actually, but we're only going to take one of them, right? And then there's some more in here. So why do we factor out? We factor out x e to the minus x cubed, yeah? Then what's left in this term? Well, we got one more x from here. We factored that e to the minus x cubed out. So we got these guys left, right? Which is a minus 3x cubed then, right? Minus 3x cubed, right? x squared, x squared, fourth, right? That would be the fourth. You can always double check by multiplying through, yeah? That's what we come from this guy. What about the next one? What's left? Good, just the two. Yeah? Okay, so here's our factored form of f prime. That makes it easy for us to make a claim about whether f prime is positive, negative, or zero. What do we love about e to stuff? Always positive, beautiful, right? Okay, well, if we were in a regular calculus problem, we'd be like, hey, this x could be positive or x could be negative, but we're doing this problem knowing that what's true about x? x is greater than or equal to one, right? So this x is positive, right, since x is greater than or equal to 1, yeah, okay, that's nicer. So positive times positive is positive, so it all comes down to this term, right? All right, let's see here, right, again, in a regular calculus problem, you would just set this to 0, and you would solve for the value of x at which, right, this guy turns 0, and that's where f prime could change sign, right? But again, what do we know? x is bigger than 1, right? So when x is 1, what do we have here? Right? We would have negative 3 plus 2. That is negative. The bigger x gets, the bigger this negative gets, plus 2, no hope, right? This guy is always negative, right? Okay? So we have positive times positive times negative. Yeah? What is positive times positive times negative? Good. This thing is always negative. If you wanted to, you could set that to 0, solve for the value of x, where this um, would change sign from positive to negative, right? You would just get the cube root of two-thirds, right? Okay. Um, okay, so the derivative is negative. If the derivative is negative um, for x greater than or equal to 1, that means it's ne is negative for x greater than or equal to 1, then that means f is decreasing. Let's just write that in there a little bit better. The derivative is negative. Uh, for x greater than or equal to 1, which implies, let's put our f prime here too, just so that we kind of see it. f prime is negative for x greater than or equal to 1, which implies f is doing what? Decreasing um, for x greater than or equal to 1, which is what we care about. And that was our third condition, right? Okay, and so... Okay, this is our three. Yep, we've satisfied the requirements of the integral test. So now, let's actually integrate. Yeah? Okay, so here we go. We justify the integral test applies. Starting to reset, that's okay. Um, 
Now let's determine what happens with this guy. Okay, so consider then the integral from one to infinity of what? Good, x squared, right? I think I heard someone say n squared, but x squared e to the negative x cubed, good, dx, right? We want to consider that because that's going to tell us what this guy does. Just going to keep this guy right here, right? You know, and that that's what we were doing. Okay, so let's think about this integral. Whew, okay, at first you might be like, oh no, it looks like integration by parts, but thankfully it's not. Um, and so what are we going to do? Let's first of all at least write again what this integral means. Um, the infinity up there means that really what are we doing? We're taking a limit as say b goes to infinity of this definite integral with finite limits, right? 1 to b. Then we're going to take a limit of the result as b goes to infinity. Yeah? Okay. So um, this is going to be what kind of integration? What do you got to do to do this? Good. This is going to be f u substitution, right? Okay. So let's come over here to the side so that we don't have to deal with changing the limits of integration for a u substitution. Let's go over here. Instead of doing this definite integral, let's do this indefinite integral. So here we are off to the side, x squared e to the minus x cubed dx as an indefinite integral instead. No limits. Yeah? Okay, so what is u? Good, u is negative x cubed. Yeah? E to stuff, right? It's the stuff. Yeah? Okay, so then what is du? Derivative of minus x cubed? Good, minus 3x squared dx. Fantastic. All right, fitness protection program, right? Okay, so we need to get rid of all the x stuff and get uh, turn this into only u stuff, right? Okay, and no connection. All right, so what do we have? We've got an x squared times dx. I've got an x squared dx sitting here. I know that I can replace x squared dx with what? Good, divide that, minus one third du, right? That is equivalent to that in hiding, yes? Okay, then what do I have left, right? So here's my u sub, and so therefore I can say that this integral is equivalent to, okay, x squared dx is getting replaced with negative one third du, right? We like to keep our constants in the front and our du stays in the back, right? Okay, so I've just replaced x squared dx with negative one third du. What is left to replace? e to the negative x cubed. What should I replace that with? Good, e to the u, right? u is negative x cubed. Do we have an integral now only in terms of u? Yes, we're safe, right? x has been safely disguised in terms of u, okay? This integral is um, equivalent to this integral. This integral is so easy, right? Because what do we have? Minus one third is a constant, multiplying constants come along for the ride, right? So it's the integral of a constant times a function is the constant times the integral of the function, right? Constant multiple rule. Um, and so what do we have? This is minus one third. What's the integral of e to the u? Everybody's favorite integral, e to the u. Love that one. Okay, good, plus c, since we're doing an indefinite integral. Um, all right, so what do we have? Final step, go back. Respect the substitution, all right? Now we leave the witness protection program. E to the u is e to the negative x cubed plus c, right? So here are all possible antiderivatives, right, of this function, right? Okay, so now what do we do? How do we use that information over here, right? So now we're back here and we're going to take the limit as b goes to infinity. Now we have a definite integral. All we needed was any easy antiderivative of this guy, right? This one's our favorite, the one with c equals zero. Um, and so we're going to take a limit 
of minus one third e to the minus x cubed evaluated between one and b, right? Okay, so now limit as b goes to infinity of what? Now I actually have to use the fundamental theorem of calculus and plug these guys in, right? b goes in first, right? So what do we have? Minus one third e to the minus b cubed minus, right, a uh, minus one third, so plus one third e to the minus one cubed, right? Which is just e to the minus one. Okay, now I could have pulled the constant out here earlier, which is usually what I do, but this time I just didn't. I don't know why. Um, but we are here, right, just to avoid the constant being annoying. Anyway, um, we're here at this stage. What do we do now, right? Remember, right, it's okay to plug b in. It's not okay to put an infinity up here, right? That's just not okay. Infinity's not a real number. Uh, not just, not even a number, right? So now what are we going to do? We want to take this limit. A lot of times, having negative exponents, you get a little bit confused when you take limits. And so, you know, another way, you may have even wanted to do this over here, is to just have written, before we even plugged in, um, is to have written this this way. This is the same as 1 over 3, right, times 1 over e to the b cubed, yeah? Right? Fraction math, or exponent math, right? We need exponent math. Got to know your exponent math. Um, well, let's just re rewrite this one just for fun, too. What is that the same as? 1 over 3e, e, yeah? That's a little combination of exponent math and fraction math, right? If you don't know those, those things, you're going to have, you're going to struggle. Anyway, here we are. So, the question is, what is this limit, right? This is a constant, okay? We can, up the, the limit of a sum is the sum of the limits, right? We have that limit rule. When we apply the limit to this First piece, this is a constant, this is a function, the limit of a constant times a function is the constant times the limit of the function. Yes? Okay. Um, so the negative one third comes along for the ride. Where is this thing going as b goes to infinity? Good. The numerator or the numerator is a constant. The denominator is growing without bound as b grows without bound, right? E to the b cubed is gonna grow without bound. E to something getting huge, it's getting huge. What is a constant divided by something getting huge without bound? Good. That goes to zero, right? So this limit, the limit of the first term is zero. The limit of the second term is the second term, right? The limit of a constant is constant. Constant rule for limits. The limit as b goes to infinity. And so what do we get? We get zero plus one over three e and one over three e. What do we really care about in this problem? What we cared about is that, what can we say then about this integral? Right? This is finite. It's just a number, right? So this integral does what? It's an improper integral, don't forget, right? Improper integral. This improper integral converges. Right? And if the improper integral converges, then what do we know? Therefore, by the integral test, the series sum n equals 1 to infinity of n squared e to the minus n cubed, right? That series. Right? Converges by the integral test. That's what that guy does. Now, does the sum of the series equal 1 over 3e? Good. Absolutely not. Okay? It does not. What is this series? Let's just look at it for a sec. When n is 1, we have e to the negative 1, right? When n is plus, right? When n is 2, we have 4 e to the negative 2 cubed. Good. 8. Let's do one more. When n is 3, what do we have? 9e to the negative 27. And it just goes on and on and on forever, right? What do we know? We know that this sums to something finite, yeah? We don't know what it sums to. So that's what the next lecture is going to be a little bit about. 
Um, we're not going to be able to necessarily find out what this sums to, but we are going to be able to maybe say, well, suppose I needed to know this sum, um, and I needed to know the actual value within some error tolerance, say, epsilon, oh, maybe, of, uh, I need to know this sum to within seven decimal places of accuracy. Do I can always approximate this sum by just adding, adding some finite number of terms, right? Adding finite number of terms is nothing new. Um, how many terms do I need to guarantee that the sum is actually within epsilon, whatever epsilon is for your error tolerance problem, of the actual answer without knowing the actual answer? Well, Matt can tell us that. That's, that's for a next lecture. Okay, um, so does this make sense? Here we are. Integral test problems justify the integral test applies. Evaluate the improper integral properly. Um, determine conversions or diversions. Make your conclusion about your series. Let's do one or two more little problems, okay? And call this video a day. to infinity of the square root of n plus 4 all divided by n squared. Does this converge or diverge? Go. You decide. What would you do? What would you do? What do you think? What's your instinct? Be careful, right? You don't just dive into being like, okay, let me integrate the square root of x plus 4 over x squared, right? I mean, it's your, so one of the things you want to also develop as you're doing these problems and as you continue doing problems is what's the most efficient way to approach these problems, okay? Um, how do I assess what's really going on here? And as I look at this, right, that doesn't look like something I really want to integrate. And even if I were going to integrate, I would rewrite it using um, algebra, right? And so let's just use some algebra before we do anything. Written as it is, it's not a geometric series. It's not a P-series. It's not a telescoping series. I don't want to go do some partial fraction thing. That, that's crazy, right? Um, and so, so, and you know, I... I should maybe have some instinct that the divergence test isn't going to help me here. But the more you problems you do, the better you'll get at that. Um, but let's just take a look at what does this algebraically reduce to? What is this term a sub n the same as, right? We've seen this a lot in, as we've developed various integration um, techniques and things that when I've got a single thing in the denominator, multiple things in the numerator, oftentimes it's just best to deal with them separately, right? Break it up. Fraction mass, right? Undo the common denominator. Square root of n over n squared plus 4 over n squared, right? That's what that is, yeah? Okay, what is the square root of n? n to the 1 half, right? Yeah, because we want that to be... Um, as a power, and so now how does this guy simplify into the one half over n squared? Rules of exponents, right? What am I going to have up here? One over n to the what power? Good, three halves. This is the way I want to write it too. It's not worth writing it with a negative exponent, right? It's not right. We shouldn't write n to the negative three halves because we have an understanding now about what we do know and what we don't know and what we're looking for. Yeah? 
okay? So what do I have here, right? Well, this is a sum, right, of two different series, right? An AN plus a BN. Oh, wait, didn't we already prove that um, if we have convergent series, right, that the sum of convergent series is the, uh, is convergent, right, and it converges to their sums, right? Um, to the sums of each individual guy. So what do we have to do? We just have to really address each guy individually, right? And what is this one? Good. It's a P series, right? Why? P is what? Three halves. What do I know about a P of three halves? Its value is what matters for a P series? Bigger than one. And if P series is bigger than one, then what do I have? Convergence, right? Yes? Good, trying to remember that. Okay, um, now what about this guy? Yeah, what about this guy? What do I have here? Four over n squared. This guy's a constant, yeah? Constant multiples, oh, we have, you proved that piece, right? You proved that the constant multiple, this is the same as four times one over n squared, right? You proved that a, uh, the sum of a constant multiple times a series is the constant times the sum of the series, right? Okay, and if that guy converges, then, then the constant multiple times it converges. So you, you did that piece. So what is this guy, right? Also a P series. What is P? P is two. What do you know about two? Good, it's bigger than one. Therefore, what? What do we have? Convergence, okay. <laughs> Whoops, convergence. <laughs> Both of these guys converge. So by our theorem from um, the previous section where we proved this, then these guys, the, the sum of these two guys converge, right? We don't know what they converge to because they're P-series, but we know that the, these, this guy converges. And we didn't have to go through a bunch of interval test work, right? Okay, so make sure you're debriefing yourself and paying attention um, to what is actually happening. Okay, let's do another problem. if we do this problem? What about um, sums of even denominators? We've got this one and one more to do. Okay, my husband is coming up here telling me to check the camera. I already checked the camera. Thank you. Camera's still running. <laughs> Gotta love extra help. Um, all right, so here we go. What about sums of even denominators? Okay, even denominators. <laughs> Sorry about that distraction. All right, what do we need? Um, so we're talking about a series. Sum n equals one to infinity, right? Of even denominators, so one over, how do we write an even number? The guy is n, so it is 2n, right? That's our favorite way to write an even number, right? Okay, so what would we say about that? Do we have to do a lot of work here? No, right? What is this? This is the sum, n equals 1 to infinity. Well, fraction math, 1 half times 1 over n, right? 1 half is a constant. Yeah, very nice. Okay, what do I know about this guy, 1 over n? Anybody seen that series before? Good. This is the, this series does what? Excellent. Why do we know this guy diverges? It's called the harmonic series, right? This famous guy. First one that blew the minds. Something crazy like that actually diverging. Um, okay, so we know this guy diverges. 
what about one of the homework problems that you were supposed to look at from the last section, right? It said that if you have a series that diverges and you multiply that series by a constant, then the um, resulting series also diverges. So based off of that problem, then that's a constant. This guy diverges. Therefore, what? The whole thing diverges. So if I add If I add, what is that, right? That's just n is 1, 1 half, plus 1 fourth, plus 1 sixth, plus 1 eighth. That grows without bound. Crazy. Yeah? It's just nutty, okay? Maybe we'll have better luck with odd denominators. Let's try that. Okay, um, yeah, ready? What about the sum of odd denominators, okay? One of the reasons I'm doing this, as you should have figured out I, by now, is that it's going to come up a lot later. We want to recognize it so we don't have to keep redoing problems that we've already seen later when this is just one aspect of a problem and not the entire problem, okay? So let's look at sums with odd denominators. n equals one to infinity, one over, what's our favorite way to an odd number? Simple way, two n plus one or two n minus one, either one, it doesn't matter, right? Okay, it's n, so we have to go with an n, we'll just go with two n plus one. That's an odd guy, odd denominator. What is that, right? Let's just write out a couple of the terms. When n is one, what do we start with? Good, one third, n plus. n is two, one fifth, one seventh, right? One ninth, on and on and on forever, right? And then is three, and then is four, yeah. Okay, well this one doesn't fit into one of our um, results that we had already talked about, right? Okay, you can't just like split fraction that way, right? You're not allowed to do that, right? That's bad fraction math. Okay, um, so we're stuck at this stage. What? Divergence test, does that work? No, the limit of this thing is zero. That tells us nothing. Is this a p-series? No. Um, it's it's kind of close to one, but it isn't one, okay? So we don't just have like, n to a power on the denominator. Um, and um, so we're not, that's not gonna, we're not gonna be able to apply that. Uh, it's not a geometric series, you know, it's not telescoping, right? What do you have left? Good, interval test. So here we go. This is our last example of the day. All right, I am going to double check one more time that this video is running, yay, okay. What's the integral test say? Okay, so we wanna consider the integral from one to infinity of f of x would be 1 over 2x plus 1 dx. Before we do that, we better check, right, the integral test applies, right? So what are the hypotheses of the integral test, right? Um, so our f of x here is 1 over 2x plus 1, right? So is this continuous on 1 to infinity? Yes, right? Why? If x is greater than or equal to one, then this denominator is never negative, or never, never zero, right? The only place that this guy is not continuous is when x is negative one half, negative one half, right? Okay, um, so this is, it's continuous. Why? Because it's continuous for x not equal to negative one half. Yeah, okay. Is it positive on one to infinity? Yes. Okay, why? Because it's positive for x greater than or equal to one, negative one half, right? If our denominator, if, if we set the denominator equal to zero, right? Two x plus one, and if x is negative one half, then if I'm over here, right? Like, like the number negative one, if x is negative one, then this is negative, and if I'm over here, it's positive, and if I'm sitting there, it's zero, right? Like a sign chart from Calc 1. 
Okay, so it's positive uh, for x bigger than negative one half and one to infinity is certainly bigger than negative one half. Third, is it decreasing? Okay, well, let's do our derivative. F prime of x would be what? Well, let's just do the quotient rule this time just to remember it. We could also do the chain rule and rewrite that as 2x plus 1 to the negative 1. But let's do the quotient rule. Um, so here's our f. So the bottom, what's the quotient rule say? The bottom, right, bottoms up, times the derivative of the top. What's the derivative of the top? Good. Zero. Don't forget to write that there, right? Um, minus, that's the sign, the top, which is 1, times the derivative of the bottom, which is good, 2 all divided by the okay, bottom squared. Awesome. So what do we have, right? This piece is zero, and so we get that f prime is negative two over two x plus one quantity squared, which is also what you would have gotten if you would have rewritten that as two x plus one to the negative one and use the chain rule, right? Um, what do we know? The top is negative, the bottom is positive, negative over positive is strictly negative, Right? Therefore, f is decreasing. Yep. Done. So we justified the integral test applies. And so here we go. Okay? Same deal. Come off to the side. I'm sure you've already finished this by yourself already. Just being like, okay, hurry it up already. Um, come off to the side. Let's do the indefinite oh, integral. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, let's do the indefinite integral. And uh, here we are. U would be what? Awesome. Denominator 2x plus 1. Screaming out at us. Make me U. Right? DU then is good to dx. What's dx? 1 half du. Beautiful. So what? When I enter the witness protection program, the U substitution program, what, do I, what does this integral become? dx gets replaced with 1 half du. We put our constants in the front, dx in the back. Yep. And then our integrand is 1 over good u. Right? Okay. This time, just for fun, we'll pull that constant out. 1 half integral of 1 over u. Whoa, whoops. 1 half du. Whoop, look, that didn't, that, we looked at that and we were like, whoa, that's bad. Right? That's what happens when you rush at the end. Um, one half, one half to you, right? Okay, are we good? All right, very nice. So this was our u sub. Another of our favorite integrals, right? We got our one half out in front as a multiplying constant. What is the integral of one over u to you? Good, the natural log of the absolute value of u, right? I still continue to insist on that. Um, can't just ignore it. All right, um, and so that is one half the natural log of the absolute value of what? Good, 2x plus 1. All right, there we go. So now we're back to here. This means the limit as b goes to infinity, the integral from 1 to b of 1 over 2x plus 1 dx. Yeah, what is the limit as b goes to infinity? Well, what is this? Uh, what is the antiderivative we want to put down here for this definite integral? It's our guy over there, 1 half natural log of the absolute value of 2x plus 1. Evaluated from 1 to b. Yeah. So, come up here. Right. Now what? A limit as b goes to infinity of what? Let's just actually even pull that one half out, just since we didn't do it last time. Just to say, right, one half is a multiplied constant, right? This is the limit. Pull that constant out, get it out of our way. Limit as b goes to infinity of the natural log, the absolute value of fundamental theorem of calculus. We can plug b in for x. 2b plus 1, right? Minus, plug 1 in for x. The natural log of, remember we pulled that 1 half already out, natural log of 2 plus 1, which is 3. Yeah? Okay? Now again, you could kind of get away with not having the absolute values because b is huge and 
positive, right? But it's just better to put them in there. It makes you less lazy, less likely to make the mistake when it matters, okay? Um, so what am I gonna do? What do I have? This is, well, limit as b goes to infinity. This guy's a constant, right? So the constant stays a constant. Limit of a difference is the difference of the limits. Limit as b goes to infinity of this guy. As b goes to infinity, 2b plus 1. Gross, unbounded, and positive, right? So the argument of natural log, gross, unbounded, goes to infinity. Where does natural log go when its argument goes to infinity? What's the range of natural log? Good. This guy goes to infinity, right? Blows up super, super, super slow, but it does it. There's a fun problem actually in here that helps you see just how slow it is. Um, and therefore, if this guy is blowing up, does natural log three have any hope of containing that? Good, excellent. So what do we know? This guy um, goes to infinity, right? This limit does not exist. Therefore, what do we know? This improper integral does what? Diverges. Very nice. Why were we doing this to begin with? Oh, yeah. Therefore, this series diverges by the integral test. So adding odd numbers doesn't help you either. This sum sums to something without bound. And with that, we will officially end this video. Um, and I will see you soon for another lecture on how to approximate. Talk to you soon. Bye.